I collapsed from exhaustion, uh, broke my cheekbone on the way down, and got four stitches on my right eye. That was two years after I had started the Huffington Post. I was working around the clock, like a lot of people in the room, and I was like ignoring the cost um, to my health and, um, and my body. For those of you who have not heard me before, this accent is for real. <laughs> I say that because I joked recently that um, I was really born in uh, California, in Fresno, I said, and I had cultivated this accent to give myself an air of being an ethnic minority. <laughs> and I received 27 letters from people asking me, how exactly did you go about changing your accent? So, you know, there's a certain level of gullibility we have to deal with. The truth is that I was born in Athens, Greece, and uh, went to school in England, and then moved here, started by moving to New York. And this is my home, an immigrant, a naturalized American. I'm just really blessed uh, to be living in this country, as we all are. And um, it's really, a special pleasure for me to be addressing you because you are dealing with one of the biggest problems in our culture and in our times, which is the, the job skill, the gap, and also with unemployment, despite um, the recovery still being a major problem, particularly among the young. This is a moment when what you are doing is making a dramatic difference in people's lives. So there is actually a real connection, too, between what we're doing at the Huffington Post and what I'm writing in Thrive and the work you're doing. And let me give you a couple of examples. We did um, a crowd rising um, initiative to raise money for uh, different um, nonprofits that are creating jobs. Because as I'm sure you know, in many of the communities that you work in, nonprofits are a major source of job creation, as well as support of different people in need at the community. And we called our initiative Job Raising. And um, we raised um, over a million dollars for those nonprofits from our community. And that, for me, makes two points. One is the important work of nonprofits in creating jobs. The other is the work that the media need to be doing a better job at, putting the spotlight on good things happening in our communities. Because the old traditional line um, was, if it bleeds, it leads, right? put bad news uh, on the front page or on the home page, and that's what people are going to gravitate to. And that's now changing. People actually prefer to share positive things, examples of generosity, ingenuity. Now, of course, at the Huffington Post, we now have 95 million unique visitors. We're in 11 countries. We cover all that is dysfunctional and corrupt, and there is plenty of that. But we also constantly put the spotlight on good things happening. We literally have dedicated sections called what is working. What is working in small business? What is working in healthcare? Um, what is working in our communities? Because that's how we can help scale and replicate the good things that are happening. And the reason I wrote Thrive and we have 26 sections on the Huffington Post dealing with the issues that Thrive covers, is because I believe that we're at an amazing turning point in the States at the moment. And the turning point is really a perfect storm of different trends. One trend has to do with the fact that as we look around our workplaces, we see that they continue to be fueled by burnout, sleep deprivation and exhaustion. And that this is not working. It's not working for women. It's not working for men. It's not working for polar bears. 
and it's not working for our healthcare system, 75% of our healthcare costs in America are because of preventable, chronic, stress-related diseases. And we women, if I can address the women in the room, have a particularly difficult time because we internalize stress differently. And so women in stressful jobs have a 40% greater risk of heart disease and a 60% greater risk of diabetes. And I came to this realization myself the hard way. Uh, on April 6, 2007, that's the opening chapter in my book, I collapsed from exhaustion, uh, broke my cheekbone on the way down and got four stitches on my right eye. That was two years after I had started the Huffington Post. I was working around the clock like a lot of people in the room and I was like ignoring the cost um, to my health and, um, and my body. So there I was going from uh, doctor to doctor, from MRI to echocardiogram to find out what was really medically wrong with me. Did I have a brain tumor? Was there a heart issue? Well, it turned out there was nothing medically wrong with me, but just about everything wrong with the way I was leading and prioritizing my life. Because, you know, Ron read to you about how I had just been chosen to be on the Time 100 Most Influential List. I was on the cover of magazines. So by a conventional definition of success, I was successful. But by any sane definition of success, if you are lying in a pool of blood on the floor of your office, you are not successful. <laughs> So that's when I decided that I wanted really to help the culture redefine what success is. Because this is something which philosophers forever have been asking, what is a good life? And somehow we reduce that to two metrics, money and power. And that's really not a good life. That's like trying to sit on a two-legged stool. Sooner or later, you're going to fall off. Because what really makes life fulfilling, what gives it purpose and meaning is what I call the third metric. And the third metric has four pillars, and each of these pillars is a section in the book. The first pillar is well-being and our health. It really is not worth it, sacrificing our health and well-being at the altar of what society considers success. I had this amazing mother, this amazing Greek mother, Yaya, as we all call her, who was unbelievably wise. And I remember once in Athens, you know, we grew up with no money, we lived in a one-room apartment, and uh, this very successful Greek businessman who was a friend of the family came for dinner and he was very proud of the fact that he had gotten a new contract to build a new museum, etc. And my mother looked at him and said, you know what, your business may be doing well, but you look to me like you're not doing well. You look to me like you've made one too many withdrawals from your health bank. <laughs> and if you continue that way, you're going to pay a price. And indeed, two months later, the man had a stroke and was admitted to hospital. And you see examples of all of us everywhere, and we simply need to increase our awareness. I, I just flew in from San Francisco yesterday, and I was in Silicon Valley, and I was talking to the tech community, and I said, you know what, guys? We are much more aware of how charged our smartphones are than how charged we are. <laughs> you know, I have my, my iPhone and it says 20% battery remaining, 17% battery remaining. If it gets down to 11%, I'm looking around like, where are my recharging shrines that I have everywhere in my office? <laughs> Um, in my home, we cover, you know, I carry two portable charging things just in case my smartphone dies. But we have no idea what's happening with us, our bodies, our minds. Often we have to be below 20% battery before we realize it. We have to be as I was on the floor to actually pay attention. So, that's one trend of what's happening 
in our culture, the burnout. Burnout has been described as the disease of our civilization, and it is a global phenomenon. It's just not here in America alone. But at the same time, what is happening is an incredible growing awareness among many businesses that what is good for the health of our employees is also good for the bottom line. And so I quote many businesses, 35% of American businesses, including General Mills and Aetna and Target, have introduced stress reduction techniques and practices into the workplace. I have a lot of examples in the book, but let me just give you one. Mark Bertolini, the CEO of the third largest health insurance company in America, Aetna, came to it again through a personal wake-up call. He had a skiing accident, broke his neck, he was hooked on narcotics, and then he discovered yoga, meditation, and acupuncture, and it had such a big impact on him that he made them available to his 49,000 employees, and then he brought in Duke University to study the impact on the bottom line, and they found a 7% reduction in healthcare costs and a 69-minute improvement in productivity every day. So what is amazing now is that we begin to have the science that proves that there is a new way to manage our work life, our workplaces, and that is actually going to lead to us being more effective, more productive, and more creative as well. So Ron and Steve, the chairman of the board, and I were meeting um, backstage, and I was quizzing them about how many hours sleep they're getting. Because after my wake-up call, that was the first habit I changed. I went from four to five hours sleep a night to seven to eight hours sleep a night. And let me tell you something. I have been much more effective, much more productive since I did that. And I quote in the book many people, including Bill Clinton, who said, the biggest mistakes I made in my life, I made them when I was exhausted. He did not specify what mistakes. <laughs> But we can all look back at our lives and remember how many mistakes we made when we were exhausted. I know for myself, when I'm exhausted, I'm more reactive. I often hire the wrong people because I ignore the red flags. Um, there, was a, um, there was a piece recently in the New York Times by Erin Cullen, who was the first uh, woman CFO of Lehman Brothers, and she wrote how she had sacrificed everything to her job. She worked around the clock. Her marriage was destroyed. And I thought to myself, one thing she didn't mention is that it wasn't actually good for Lehman Brothers either. It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so maybe, you know, if executives took better care of their human capital, their businesses would thrive as well. And that's what is the... So Ron got six hours sleep last night instead of five, and he said he's feeling much better. And you know, baby steps, guys. I'm not suggesting changing things overnight. In fact, at the end of each section of the book, I have three baby steps that anybody can take. So four sections, three baby steps, turns out to be 12 steps. I didn't intend it that way. <laughs> But the point is that the important thing is to move from knowing what we should be doing to actually doing it. So I want Thrive to be a bit of a bridge. So let me just quickly, just before we move to the second pillar of wisdom, in the well-being section, let me just quickly read you the, the three steps. So the first one is, unless you're one of the wise few who already gets all the rest you need, you have an opportunity to immediately improve your health, creativity, productivity, and sense of well-being by getting just 30 minutes more sleep than you are getting now. And if something happens, if there are some mothers in the room who have uh, newborn babies and they can't do that, try and get a 20-minute nap in. I recently gave a commencement address at Smith, and I told the women graduates that I have one piece of advice for them, and it is to sleep their way to the top. <laughs> the
the second one is really simple. It's like moving our bodies, walking, stretching, just moving. I now have started having walking meetings. Um, not when the weather is like that, but as soon as the weather turns better, if I'm going to be meeting with someone one-on-one, -on -one, we just walk. It's just a great way of communicating and being outside and uh, getting the movement that the science unequivocally now tells us we all need. And the third thing, the third step, is introducing at least five minutes of quiet time into our day. It could be meditation, it could be prayer, it could be fly fishing. Anybody here fly fishers? You know, yes, like you see, there's always somebody fly fishing in any room. <laughs> you know, if you are fly fishing, you cannot be on your smartphone at the same time. So that's what I'm trying to do, to say, give ourselves a little time when we are actually not consumed by our technologies and our to-do lists. I've actually introduced a little more silence in my life. I used to walk into my hotel room or into my apartment, immediately turn on the television because I say, hey, I run a 24-7 media operation. I need to know everything that's happening. And then I decided, you know, I need a little more silence in my life. So I'm not going to turn on the TV the minute I walk in. And you know what? I discovered two things. One, I haven't missed a thing. <laughs> because trust me, if you turn on the TV two weeks from now, you're going to think that they are running reruns <laughs> because so much of it is regurgitated. And also, you can pick up the news so quickly. Just go to the Huffington Post, right? And it's all there on the home page. <laughs> so the second pillar of this third metric that creates a fulfilling life is wisdom. You know, we look around and we have an enormous amount of very smart leaders in politics, in business, in media, making terrible decisions. Here in Washington, it's particularly true. It's not that they are not smart, it's that they are not wise. And in order to be wise, we need to connect to our own wisdom. And it's very hard to do that if we are perpetually connected to our devices. So one of the points I recommend here is that we actually pick a time at the end of our day before we go to sleep when we gently escort our devices out of our bedroom. Because if you charge your smartphones by your bed, when you wake up in the middle of the night for whatever reason, you're going to be tempted to look at your data, right? Admit it. And if you do that, you are going to be much less recharged when you wake up in the morning because you've allowed your day life to intrude into your night life. 55 pages of scientific endnotes at the end of the book will give you all the evidence from studies at Harvard, at Stanford, about that. And the reason I included all these endnotes is because I wanted to convince the most stubborn skeptic that this is now the new science validating ancient wisdom. And we can make our lives, especially in times of difficulty, much more resilient when we apply them. And for everybody here who is helping people in difficult times, you know, people who've lost their jobs, people who are worried they may lose their jobs or haven't been able to find a job, one of the things that is so important is to help people be more resilient as they are facing difficult times. I quote in the book the study of the Illinois Bell Telephone that was one of the biggest downsizings in American history. They, they fired 50% of their employee force. And then there was a study done where they followed the people who were downsized to see what happened. And two thirds of them broke down in some way or another. They became depressed alcoholics, they got divorced, they could not handle the loss of their job. One third actually thrived. And they used the challenge to tap into resources in themselves they didn't even know they had. And they went on to bigger jobs or to start their own businesses. So what happens to us is one thing, but how we react to what happens to us is really at the heart of what kind of life we're leading. And uh, 
I was recently at a friend's memorial. And when you go to a friend's memorial, you realize that our memorials, our eulogies, have very little to do with our resumes. Have you ever been to a, um, a memorial and you hear a eulogy say, uh, you know, George was absolutely amazing. He increased market share by one third. <laughs> Because our eulogies are about the other things. They're about the third metric things. They're about how we made people feel, um, what made us love, small kindnesses, uh, lifelong passions. And yet so often in life we forget all that. And we just shrink everything down to our to-do list. That's what we need to change. And you have an opportunity through the work you're doing with the workforce boards and all the career counselors, often meeting people in very challenging circumstances to help them see where the strength and the wisdom can come from. So the, the third pillar is actually a pillar that is getting very little attention in our lives, and this is the ability to wonder and find joy and delight in life. So often we miss that out. And when we can bring joy back in our lives, everything gets better. And again, it's a function of how we approach what happens. I, I, I opened this chapter by um, my being in Munich for the launch of the Huffington Post in Germany. And um, I was going to the airport and it was raining a little bit like here. But it was a new city and everything was glistening and it was just an amazing morning. And then I arrived at the airport and everybody was complaining about the rain. And I thought again, it's our own attitude to what happens that determines how we respond to what life brings us. And in fact, when I was in Germany, I saw how much of a recognition the German a labor minister at the time, Ursula von der Leyen, who is now the defense minister, how much of a recognition she had given to burnout in the German workplace. She saw it as a major loss of um, income for Germany because of um, absenteeism, um, sickness, not to mention healthcare costs. And a lot of businesses are beginning to take steps. Volkswagen, for example, now gives employees company phones that automatically turn off at 6 p.m. and uh, start again at 7 a.m. So a lot of companies are now pioneering ways to help their employees learn to disconnect, recharge, renew themselves, and come back in a regenerated state. I mean, even Goldman Sachs, I don't know if you read recently, they asked their junior analysts to take off weekends, a radical idea in the investment industry. <laughs> they did that after a certain number of suicides in the investment industry, which got everybody's attention. But the point is that everywhere now, there is a growing awareness about the dangers of burnout and the way it stops us both at the individual level and at the company level from doing the best we can do. So the final pillar is giving. And you know, without giving, life becomes very narcissistic and very shrunken, and giving is what completes everything. And when we talk about giving, it doesn't mean giving up our job and going to Rwanda to start an orphanage, fantastic though it is when people do that. It can mean, again, baby steps of how we can get from just being a go-getter to also being a go-giver. And I think it's fantastic when our communities and, and our media celebrate go-givers. And one of the three little steps that I recommend is to find out what are our talents that maybe we had when we were children and then we abandoned because we couldn't make a living from them. And I think now, as we look at the changing face of work, we see that a lot of people going back to these talents 
It could be crafts, it could be singing, and find new entrepreneurial ways to also make a living out of them. I spoke recently to Etsy.com, and you see a lot of people who left companies and are making a living in these much more entrepreneurial ways. So again, I think this is incredibly interesting where the workforce boards and the career counselors are, because we can also recommend new ways to look at jobs. I have a section also in the book about women in that respect, because a lot of women, actually 43% of women, after they have children, leave the workforce. And only 40% of them return full time. But if we can change the nature of work to make it much more project based, with much more flexibility, it's going to be much easier not to lose all that talent and have these women come back to work full time because it's not really about how many hours are you at your desk anymore. We don't pay people for their stamina, we pay them for their judgment. And sometimes we forget that. You know, you can be at your desk and updating your Facebook profile all day. <laughs> you know, what really matters is how present are we and how creative are we? And as we are talking about the second industrial age, the second machine age, when machines are going to take over so much of the work we do, what we need and what's going to be at a premium is creativity. And creativity is very dependent on how connected we are with ourselves. Burnout, trust me, is the death of creativity. And we want everybody to be able both to come up with new ideas and to be able to adjust to new ideas and to change because that's all that's going to be happening increasingly, constant change. So it's really an amazing time to be alive because it's a real turning point where we are recognizing the cost of how we have been organizing the workplace, the cost to our individual lives and the cost to our companies. $300 billion is what American businesses are losing because of stress of their employees a year. And that doesn't even count indirect costs, which are another 200 to 300% more. But often these issues were considered like soft issues, and now we are beginning to realize that they are not soft issues. These are like major issues that affect the bottom line, which is why every university practically now has a kind of sleep and burnout division that gave it different names as part of their schools of medicine. I mean, in fact, because I've been such a sleep evangelist since my collapse, um, the Harvard School of Medicine Sleep Division invited me to join their board, so I now get endless material <laughs> every day. And one of my fa and and the business magazines now are full of that. I mean, on on uh, Friday, Forbes had a story about how two thirds of Silicon Valley startups fail because of the founders' sleep deprivation. That's like amazing because, you know, the, people think that if you work around the clock, that's the only way to succeed. And that's what we need to change. You know, the idea that working 24-7 is a good thing, it is not. In fact, I, people, you know, in many companies still use that term to praise employees. You know, George is amazing. He works 24-7. I immediately interrupt people and I say, well, then there is a real problem. In fact, the Boston Consulting Group now um, has what they call red zone reports for any consultants who are billing too many hours, they feel there's a problem here because they've seen what happens when people burn out. So it's really exciting when we are creating new role models and new paradigms. And as I'm on this book tour, I was recently pre-taping an interview with Oprah that's airing on Mother's Day as part of her program called Super Soul Sunday. And, and she said to me how she used to really be so exhausted when she started her show many years ago that she would go home and fall asleep in her clothes. 
And I said to her, and I say to every successful person, you know what? You are not opera. You are not as successful as you are because you worked around the clock. That's the illusion. You would have been where you are if you had worked less crazy and you would have enjoyed it more and it would have been better for your health and everything else. And I say the same to myself and I say the same to my two daughters who are starting in life, 22 and 24, and to everyone. We just need a new paradigm of new examples to show that the way we thought we had to do success doesn't work. And what we define success doesn't work. And I think women, if I can address the women in the room again, will have to lead this revolution uh, because the world the way it is now was designed by men and it's not working. <laughs> so, you know, the first women's revolution was giving us the vote. The second women's revolution was um, giving us access to all the jobs and the top of every field. And the third one is going to be for us to say, not just we want to be at the top of the world, but we want to change the world. And you men are going to be so grateful to us. <laughs> so let me wrap it all up by saying I would love to continue this conversation. Um, um, in fact, I would love you to write about your own experiences um, with the workforce boards, with your own lives, and in order to make it easy and to help you bypass the growing Huffington Post bureaucracy, I'm going to give you my email address and you can email me directly and that's Ariana with one R and two N's at HuffingtonPost.com. You see, when you found a company, you get a good email address. <laughs> and also, for those who want to delve deeper into these themes, we're having a, a conference um, in New York um, the evening of the 24th of April and the 25th, a, a thriving conference. And you can get information about that and everything else at HuffingtonPost.com slash thrive. Uh, this is a journey that we are all on together. And uh, because the world continues to send everybody constant signals and is full of signposts about how we can get more money and more power and and allow ourselves to burn out because we feel that's the only way to succeed, we need to actually create new groups, new rituals, and new ways to reimagine the workplace and our lives and to recognize that when we find that place in us of wisdom, strength, wonder, and giving, we are able to live our lives with more productivity, more compassion, and yes, more sleep. Thank you.